Mount Bear site after the tsunami. Uh, it's happening all the time. It's, it is, if I can, my one thing on, on blogging is it's not either or, right? It, it, it's, it complements, it pushes, it embellishes, it adds to existing media. It's, you know, it's... But the it's, traditional media is controlling those efforts and going through those blogs and those are like single, single people or they're being, you know, distributed. What about bloggers coming together and syndicating their own content? Uh, uh, Greensboro 101 is an early attempt at that. Um, it allows people to upload video, for example, audio. But there's a, there's a lot, you know, we're, we're early stages there. I'm going to get to Dave. Anybody who has not spoken? Yes. yes? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm here and here. Uh, I'm Karen Mann from manworld.blogspot.com. I wanted to know how this recent round of firings has uh, affected people. Are people afraid to post on their blogs for fear of being fired? Yeah, <laughs> yeah as, as you all know, uh, a blogger uh, from the Durham Herald Sun um, was fired. She was blogging. You know, she was also trash talking her colleagues. If she didn't get fired, she was going to get beat up in the hallway. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not in favor of firing or beating up, by the way. But, I mean, you know, have, are people intimidated to blog because of their work situation? I, just, I never, ever blog about anything that's happening in my workplace. And, and sooner or later, they're going to catch me blogging from work. I mean, they're going to figure out that, that I'm doing it. It's actually against the company rules. You're not supposed to do it. So. <laughs> Hi, next, next to last. Dan Coleman. I write for uh, Art Politics with Ruby. And I want to add a couple things to her comments on the way Art Politics has had an impact. One is um, just very simply through information. An example that comes to mind is after the 2003 <coughs> elections. Will Raymond here, who doesn't blog, um, put out tons of information on campaign finance. It was like a real bulldog in terms of revealing connections among candidate positions and donors and things that are going to be helpful into the future. The other point is that the blog keeps a certain intensity on an issue that you can't get through any other media other than a direct meeting. And it keeps people engaged gets ideas out, it gets the nuances of positions of elected officials out into people's minds, it keeps meetings that are important in people's awareness. And so I think, in a way, that can't be measured very directly. <coughs> There's a lot of impact on the issues that people on the block get engaged in. Dave, did you have a, a real quick one in response to the question that you asked, which is, that already happens, that kind of aggregation happens. Uh, uh, they're talking about Glenn Reynolds and Insta Pundit. I mean, there, there are like sort of tiers to the biosphere. You know, places that have higher flow and higher flow, you can go upstream from there. When there's a need for it, it, it develops. Uh, uh, on September 11th, <coughs> well, that was a major milestone for the biosphere, 2001, and we were getting first-hand reports from people, you know, probably a good, 24 hours before the mainstream media was catching it. Um, and uh, people found it. I mean, I, I can tell you from my logs, my draft logs went through the roof that day. Well, these were a lot of new readers, people that were finding about, you know, this was a place where you could go or that was a place you could go. Word of mouth works great here, and there are sort of bright spots developing. So, so communities can be ad hoc. Communities can be self-creating. Um, like, uh, I guess the classic example that they, they uh, wired used to use to factor in the bubble of how we were all going to work was the, the movie production company where you bring in people and then they finish a project and they go away. And you'll see some of that. The lightning round is concluded. Is there anybody who has to talk? Has to talk? I don't know if that sounds negative. Is there anybody who didn't get to talk who really has something they want to say before we all go have donuts? Yes. Last, this is the last word. Okay. Okay. I'm very grateful about a loud blogger. And, yeah, um, right, right. As I try to get through this, you'll understand why. And I think there's a, there's a real quality that bloggers have that I think is kind of hard to understand. People who are not as that, that are not as bloggers have, and that fluency. The ability to be able to have this kind of flow. Stuff that you all probably can, can throw out in five or ten minutes probably would take me two hours. And I'm not, there are a lot of other people like me who never want to say that because that's not something people like to admit. But there's a question, there are a lot of us out there. And how, who is doing the brokering, the connecting, reaching out, 
Because what's happened, I've been working in the field of community technology since 1990, working and trying to get nonprofits online. And just as we're sort of trying to get that and trying to get them to understand what it's for, what happens is the whole <coughs> kind of blogging community has sort of almost taken itself out of the equation and created division. And I think that the real challenge that I'd love to see people interesting in, in, in address. A couple of ways to bring uh, that issue uh, bring bloggers into that, that larger world. One is blog slowly. Jay Rosen writes twice a week at Press Thing. Um, he's worth reading. He's a, think, he's a slow writer, a, a deep thinker. Another way is not everybody's a writer. Um, that's why podcasting is big. Um, and, and maybe we'll, I, I guess there's going to be a podcasting lunch, but some people think better out loud. Um, some people make videos. So a lot of this grassroots technology starts out because text is easy, um, but it's going to add richer media that other people will find their niche. And finally, um, it's not the death of the static web page. It's a link to and from the static web page. Uh, this concludes our broadcast. Everybody got a donut? He's back. We'll see you in 10 minutes. This is the, we're going to start with a commercial break first. Um, <laughs> back, back in the back. Yeah, this is uh, sort of Google posted ads. Uh, Back at the back, we have Dan Gilmore's book, which you can pay for and buy in a handsomely bound design <laughs> thing from O'Reilly Press. Uh, there are no animals on the front, unlike many O'Reilly books. <laughs> or you may download it for free and uh, pay for the printing and not get any binding or any of the other stuff. And then, okay. Uh, also, uh, or, 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 or ruin your eyes reading the PDFs. That's right. <laughs> PDFs are bad. Uh, English text is open. <laughs> Speaking of open and open source, you know, this conference was organized really around the wiki and around a lot of software that we downloaded. And one of the guys who's actually helping pay for our coffee and donuts and a, not, a little bit of swag is Bob Young. Bob's here. And his new company is Lulu. And he, I've told Bob, that I've encouraged Bob to give a short spiel about Lulu and about Bob. If anybody is running Red Hat uh, Linux, you know Bob. <laughs> He's here. Thank you, Paul. My favorite uh, Canadian. I, I'm here because I'm a big fan of Paul Jones, actually. Who else is a big fan? <laughs> <laughs> I was explaining to Dan, who wasn't where quite how much progress our Biblio has made that, you know the old expression, nice guys finish last? If you need proof that that is not true, Paul is, is standing in front of you. It's, it's a great story. Um, I was going to give you a 30 second commercial on Lulu, except the problem is there's a bunch of Lulu guys here. We're not here to sell you guys anything. We're here to learn something from this stuff. I mean, we don't yet, uh, well, at least I don't. Steven knows a little bit about blogging. Uh, but we do have a cool site. It doesn't cost anything to use. It, it's sort of eBay-like. So we'd love it if you guys would poke at it and tell us what you don't like about this thing. Because um, we really do need to figure out how to, well, our elevator pitch is we're trying to do for the publishing industry what Red Hat did for the software industry. Put the author back in control of his time. Um, People are already using Lulu to publish their uh, their blogs, uh, not hugely successfully. You know, they sell a couple of books, but uh, we need the, the expertise. So thank you, and, and thank you for inviting us to this great conference. Thank you. Um, one other person I'd like to point out who's here who's uh, influential to my thinking of journalism and a lot of other people's too, is Phil Meyer, who's sitting right here. And Phil is the author of The Vanishing Newspaper. Phil is probably the best observer of the newspaper business and, and communication business out there. He also regularly writes for USA Today, and he's my colleague in the School of Journalism. And I encourage you, if you're part of what we're going to talk about here is journalism, the history of journalism, and how this fits, and where all kinds of uh, communications and where we fit, as a part of We the Media, and if we weren't informed by Phil's research, we probably would just be sort of waving our hands at it. And uh, next, I guess we're ready to say something. Should I be saying more? Or did, you? did you want to? 
start off with? Something? I guess I could. Um, one of the things that Dan and I agreed on is we, uh, we did publish some issues to discuss here, and I think some other people might have published some issues to discuss. This was on the wiki. Yeah, if you didn't like the agenda, you could have changed you it. You could have changed what we're talking about. <laughs> and in fact, if you're online yeah. now, you could change it, except I'm not going to reload the page at this point. <laughs> <laughs> so it may not matter. Uh, so it, here's, here's what we're going to talk about is finding a cause, building an audience, uh, a little bit about comment systems, because as you noticed from the beginning, it sort of, comments are sort of a binary deal. And uh, we'd like to talk about how maybe not to make them binary. If you, either you have them or you don't, I guess. Yeah. Um, just an a answer to an earlier question about comments. I was going to quote Matt Gross because he told me some stuff about those numbers, but now he's here. So, oh, good. Um, uh, Matt, yeah. where'd you go? Over here. OK. You, you had, the question came up earlier, um, how many readers what percentage of readers comment, read comments, follow links, and all that kind of stuff. And I know at the Dean campaign where you were the blogging Fuba official title, um, you had uh, some, some numbers on those, some rough numbers. Yeah, I mean, just as a general rule of thumb, we found that about 5% of your readers would actually open a comment thread, and less than 1% would actually open a comment. 1% of readers or 1% of the 5%? Uh, less than 1% of, of the total. So, twenty percent. You know, if you had ten thousand readers, maybe. Oh, I can, if you had one hundred readers, half of them would open a comment thread, and maybe one would post a comment thread. Thank you, uh, George. I, I just I want to make one uh, comment about the comments, and that is, it really depends on how your site's designed. Right. Ruby's site, when you if you want to read the article, you read the, the comments are there. Yep. Slash dot dot org. You read the, the article, you read the comments. And, and I think there's, there are just different ways to emphasize things. And I like comments a lot. I guess we're going to talk about comments for a while. Uh, per, permal, on permalinks, too, peop, the, uh, often if you're being pointed to by somebody, you're getting to a page where the comments are integrally part of the posting. So that, again, is a design issue and yeah. one can, that. Can everybody hear him? Hold on a minute. We've got an audio thing here. Let's see if what happens if we do this. Now try it. Oh, the on switch. <laughs> <laughs> it works better. We, uh, do, I, do I have enough stuff on my belt? We've tried, to, <laughs> we've tried to turn him into Batman. <laughs> His utility belt here. This actually, you, you said comments are binary. And that, in, in the community question, that, uh, that they're more than binary in the sense of just on or off. They're also binary and often in the question of you know, crappy and not. And, uh, That's pretty easy to tell. And one of, the, one of the really serious questions about having comments in, in the whole community thing is the, uh, the existence of trolls, of people whose goal in life seems to be to uh, disrupt or just to be mean. And uh, it, it's a pretty serious issue. And one of the things that I'm hoping we can get better technology for is uh, actually keeping the trolls out on a more permanent basis because right now you have to play whack-a-mole with these folks and you know they you slam them down and they show up over there and just r sign on with a different IP address so uh, I'm interested in what people would like to see in a comment system because I'm thinking a lot about how to make this work better reader moderation is clearly got to be part of it I think Matt's folks had a really clever uh, response to trolls, which was the uh, when when they saw a troll posting on the Dean weblog, the response was, "Every time you see a troll, send money to the campaign." And now apparently that worked enough that the trolls were daunted. Is that fair? <laughs> That was actually something that came up from the readership, you know, um, which was the amazing thing. I, I don't think it would have worked if we had said, give us five bucks every time a troll appears, but the fact that other people, it was their way of responding to, you know, the political troll <coughs> show up in the blog for American Threads. Okay, well, so, 
And it, Paul and I were just, before this uh, started, we were thinking about how uh, this is going to lead on directly from the last session and the one before. The whole question of community and uh, this, this applies to both communities of geography, really, and communities of interest. That what the thing that, uh, one, one thing a community needs is uh, information about what's going on, call it news, for lack of a better word. And in, in physical communities, newspapers have really played an important role over the long the last uh, century or so and longer, but uh, I, I don't want to get into a, an issue here of whether newspapers are going to survive or not. There's an unraveling <coughs> business model, there's no doubt about that. Uh, whether it's going to completely come apart is a matter of some debate. But we have an opportunity, I think, doing things online and actually getting together in places like this to rethink the news process. And I'm hoping, I, I mean, I want to listen as much as talk in here because I think something is going on that is going to be very important in changing the nature of how people get news and mainly in the sense that they can tell each other what the news is. But we don't have great mechanisms. Blogs are a wonderful first cut at some of this stuff. And uh, I, I'm just kind of interested in what people want to talk about in this regard and how do we foster a community, how do we do good journalism. Um, you know, my goal is to bring some of the best of the traditional journalism world into this wonderful energy and knowledge from the edges of networks because if we can combine the two, I think we get something quite powerful. So uh, I'm going to pick on Ed just to start. Uh, to, is anyone here from the Greensboro paper, by the way? Uh, then I'll pick on Ed to tell us about what sounds like one of the really great experiments. Uh, well, just, I've been a contributing columnist to the News and Record for eight years. I'm not an employee, and I think that gives me a little freedom um, to be inside and out at the same time. Um, the News and Record, as, as you may know, has really opened itself up to blogging. Um, they've committed themselves to remaking their website okay, in what they call a public square. Um, one of the fun things about that is they've committed themselves to doing that in public. So they published their own internal memo on what they were going to do. They solicited input um, from their own local community and from across the country. Um, on what people want to see. They've done stuff, as I mentioned, like putting the letters to the editor online. The editor-in-chief is blogging. Uh, he's quite good at it. The editorial page editor is blogging. Um, one of his um, colleagues on the editorial page is not only blogging, he's saying stuff like, you know, in today's second unsigned editorial, we only scratched the surface of what we talked about and what we thought, and here's what Jesse Jackson really said when we interviewed him yesterday. So they're really pushing uh, themselves out to the community, opening up, showing personality, inviting community input, linking off their own site to other blogs. Um, they have not as yet begun to incorporate uh, in any meaningful way other than links um, independent blogging content at their site, but that certainly seems to be under consideration. And as I mentioned before, um, they're taking uh, Ginny Hoggard's uh, fight with cancer and publishing it in the print version. They've taken blog posts of mine and then fed them through their own reporting and editorial uh, machinery and published them in print. So they're using blogs as reporters and as feelers out in the community. Um, one of the things I always, always say when I get interviewed about this, about what's going on in Greensboro is we are not unique. We're, we're not even the first in some ways, but we're, you know, given the size of the paper, the size of the city, um, and the size of the effort, it, it does seem to be uh, one of a kind at this moment in history. But there's nothing that they're doing and we are doing as a community that you can't do in your community and at your newspaper if you're willing to try it. Um, that's probably the most important message is this is a very 
democratic uh, medium, the web, and you can all use it. Yeah. Who owns the paper? Who owns the paper is owned. Um, did Dave want to tell you to ask that question? No. <laughs> what? <laughs> Landmark. The paper, yeah. the paper Landmark is uh, owned by Landmark, which is a big company in Virginia. Um, but it has a lot of autonomy, and an interesting thing about the business side of what they're doing, they're accepting the proposition they need to sell ads online to, and create content online to make money in the future. But for the moment, they are journalists playing with a new journalism toy, and they're not committed to making money on it. They're not worried about a business model. Um, it's low cost, low cost of entry. So they have Lex Alexander running it, and they gotta pay his salary, but other than that, they are not worried at this moment about getting quick payback. And so you can do that at your paper too, I hope. Okay, Bob's got his hand up. Yeah, it, it, this is a really interesting, there's no such thing as a coincidence. I was gonna say, right. Um, Landmark, you think it's a stodgy old world uh, newspaper company up in Norfolk, Virginia. Frank <coughs> Batten Jr., the CEO of Landmark, was the original venture capital investor in Red Hat in 1997. <laughs> This guy sat on the Red Hat board for four years after that. He understands community as well as any of us in this room. Yeah, I hmm. think I think one of the things about Landmark is it isn't a kind of interesting entrepreneurial company. They also are the guys who invented the Weather Channel. Uh, basically, out of Terra, the story is that Frank Batten Sr. went to a, a talk by Ted Turner, and Ted was in the manic phase. And she told everybody as, this as was, opposed to well, he had, <laughs> you don't see him in the other one apparently and told so the newspapers were going to be gone in five years because CNN was going to take everything and Batten senior actually unlike most people who said this is terrible he went and went this is really I, I should be worried about this because the Norfolk papers not all that big uh, and he went and interviewed different uh, people from the local televisions and said, how did you, you know, how do you get content? What do you do? And the weatherman said, oh, I get all mine free from the government. <laughs> <Pow>. <laughs> and if you're wrong, you can blame it on someone else, right? It's a, it's yeah, a he did lose money for five years on the Weather Channel, though. Um, and there's a pretty good book. I don't want to hype.